I am so excited and grateful to be here with you all today. Um, my name is Kelly Davis. I'm the Associate Vice President of Peer and Youth Advocacy at MHA. Um, and today's webinar is part of our Young Mental Health Leaders Series um, with MHA and the Global Mental Health at Harvard Initiative. And this session is going to focus on an incredibly important topic, um, young leaders in school-based mental health policy, MHA. Um, for those who didn't see, I can drop in the chat. We recently put out um, a report reviewing uh, mental health education in schools policy over the summer and know that this has been an incredibly, obviously important, but also um, there's been a lot of action in this area. So super excited to get to talk with two um, phenomenal folks who've been leading. Um, so just as an overview, um, so this webinar is part of our Young Mental Health Leaders Series webinars, and it's a partnership between MHA, um, for those who, you know, I'm sure y'all are familiar, but MHA is uh, founded in 1909, um, nation's oldest mental health advocacy organization. We were founded by a man named Clifford Beers with lived experience, um, who was in an, who's a student at Yale, and in and out of the state psychiatric hospitals of the time in the early, late 1800s, early 1900s, um, and really found that, um, started this movement for mental health reform based on the idea that lived experience was really important in how we change, build and change and make things better. Um, and the Global Mental Health uh, Program at Harvard has been leading some phenomenal work all over the world. Um, and we have a lot of uh, collaborative interests around working with young people and innovation and empowering community members to support the mental health of one another. And this initiative was really inspired um, by our shared commitment to elevate the ideas of young people by bringing together young leaders doing the work on the ground with folks who are um, more in academic institutions researching that work. Um, and just some housekeeping. Uh, some housekeeping for today. So all participants are muted um, and unable to turn on your microphones. If you have questions, comments, concerns, I'll be monitoring the chat box, um, but you can also feel free to put your um, questions in the Q&A. So we'll be talking for about 45 minutes and then we'll have um, a brief time for a question and answer at the end. Um, as I mentioned, today's session is being recorded. So a link to the recording will be sent out to everybody who's registered um, within the next week. We also have a page on our website, mhanational.org slash webinars, where you can find all of our webinar recordings. Um, we also have closed captioning. If you go to the bottom of your screen, um, you should, you'll be able to click the CC closed captioning button. If you're having any difficulty with that, happy to help in the chat. Um, we don't offer CEUs, so we do have the opportunity um, to share a certificate of attendance that you will get um, emailed to you with the link to the webinar recording. Um, and when, final thing, um, when using the chat box, make sure that your message is sent to the correct audience so you can send a message to panelists only or you can send it to everybody. Um, and without further ado, I will introduce today's panelists and then um, catch up on the chat. I see it's blowing up. Hopefully everybody's sharing where they are and what they're looking forward to. Um, so today's speakers, so today's speakers first is Ben Bauman. So Ben Bauman is a Cornelius Vanderbilt scholar at Vanderbilt University. Um, the mental health crisis in America has always been, been very present within and around his life. With many around him struggling with mental health, he sought from a young age to make change where nobody else seems to be. To make this change, he has started and led several projects to support the mental health of his community. These have included leading a team of students to conduct research into his school district's counseling departments, which culminated in meetings with county leaders. To effect more widespread change, he founded DMV Students for Mental Health Reform, a mental health coalition which seeks to unite student advocates, clubs, and schools from around the DMV into a cohesive unit for advocacy. To create a more immediate impact for students, he also developed the Students for Students program. This program is based on the group peer support model and seeks to act as an extension of the under-resourced counseling department. Um, next up, we have Cameron Vigil. Cameron currently works at a national nonprofit, nonpartisan organization called Young Invincibles as the Colorado, uh, as the Colorado Engagement Manager. In this role, she leads Young Invincible's young adult programming, 
where she trains diverse young adult leaders on public policy. Cameron stays engaged with her childhood community by co-creating and running a local scholarship, the Leticia Oeda Salinas Scholarship, dedicated to financially supporting students interested in pursuing higher education and reducing mental health stigma and youth suicide. Cameron most recently served on the Mental Health America's 2021 Young Mental Health Leaders Council, same with Ben. Um, so super, uh, have gotten an awesome amount of time to work with Cameron. Um, and she currently serves as the co-chair of the Colorado State Youth Council, a subcommittee of the Education and Training Steering Committee of the Colorado Workforce Development Council. Cameron graduated from the University of Colorado Denver in 2017 with a BA in sociology and then from Regis University in 2019 with a master's in nonprofit management. Um, so Cam and Ben were on MHA's Young Adult Mental Health Leaders Council. We're gonna make our announcement of this year's council at the end of next week. So super excited to share with y'all the new group of awesome folks from around the country mm -hmm. doing really great stuff. Um, and then finally, we have Juliana Restiva. Um, Juliana is the program coordinator for the Global Mental Health at Harvard Initiative and the assistant to Professor Vikram Patel. Based in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School, she is responsible for the administrative tasks, event programming, and communications of the initiative, as well as supporting Dr. Patel's administrative needs. She is also a research assistant on the National Institute of Mental Health funded U19 Scale Up Hubs Project, Essence. Uh, prior to joining Harvard, Juliana worked in the Department of Global Health at Boston University School of Public Health as the events and communication specialist and the executive assistant to the chair of the Global Health Department. Juliana received her MPH degree focused on global health from Boston University School of Public Health and her BS degree in biology and psychology from Loyola University of Maryland. So with that, I will turn it over to our awesome panelists. Thanks so much, Kelly. It's so great to be here with you all. Um, I'm really excited about this panel and our whole webinar series where we have been, like Kelly said, really um, connecting with uh, youth leaders and uh, individuals who are working in situ um, positions like mine um, that are managing research portfolios and really trying to understand what's the situation um, for young adults. So, uh, just to give a little bit of background, though, I know with this group, we definitely do not need um, much more than a little bit. So as one of the things that my uh, mentor and supervisor, uh, Professor Vikram Patel, always says, um, with a lot of the uh, youth um, and adolescent work that he does is that young adults, whether it be millennials, Generation Z, Generation Alpha, are the world's demographic dividend, the engine of every society across history. Um, we our generation, uh, we're all, all three of those generations of young, of, of young adults and youth are the vanguard of social movements from preserving our climate to combating ex extremist ideologies and essential for a progressive, sustainable planet. So with all of that, the health and well-being of the youth is critical importance um, to the present and the future for all of us. Uh, so it's amazing to be here with Ben and Cameron and all of you in the chat um, to talk about how we can improve um, mental health policy um, in schools for these youth. So just to say a few things, which I know a number of you already know, but um, from ages 10 to 34 um, in 2018, the uh, Suicide Prevention Resource Center had suicide as the second um, ranking or leading cause of death by age in the US, um, second only to unintentional injury. And that's only in relation to, to suicide. Um, and 48% of suicides have gone up in the age group of 15 to 24 from 2009 to 2018. And obviously these are very depressing numbers to see, but what gives me hope is that since that time, there's been recognition of the need to really tackle mental health um, policy and mental health uh, resources and access for our youth. So I know that because these numbers were alarming at the time, um, since all the work that's gone through based because of people like Cameron and Ben and many of you in the chat, um, we are making progress and recognizing the need. Um, so without further ado, I want to make sure that we hear from um, our two amazing panelists. And I've heard Kelly talk about both of you so much whenever we've had the chance to interact and talk about who would be panelists, what's the work she's doing with her council. Um, so I am very excited to actually have the opportunity to talk to you both. 
Um, so let's start with you, Ben. Um, if you could share a little about your work and how you got started on the work that you did um, that Kelly, uh, when she introduced you, and then we'll have the same question for Cameron. Absolutely. I'll try to not take too long with this, but um, I'd say my work and my moment with mental health probably started way back in middle school for me, uh, in probably eighth grade. So for context, that's when you're 12, 13. Um, and even all the way back then, you know, I'm still starting to see some you know, of the detrimental effects of mental health kind of starting to show on friends of mine. And all the way back then, and I mean, even throughout high school, we weren't really given too much of a mental health education. So you know, I'm seeing my friends struggling and I'm, I'm not really sure what to do about it because, you know, I, terms like depression, anxiety, they have absolutely no meaning for me at that time. Um, so I guess that was kind of the driver, just seeing my friends struggling and I started to Know, try to educate myself a little bit more about you know what mental health is and how I can be a resource to my friends and support them um, and that got me to be fairly educated with mental health uh, and trying to just be a good friend to those around me um, and that kind of started to snowball a little bit as I got into high school and towards sophomore year when I started seeing you know more and more people really struggling for mental health to the point where I started thinking you know this isn't natural is this, or not natural is probably a good word but um, this isn't what's supposed to be happening. This many people shouldn't be struggling like this. So I started to look around, started to ask questions. Um, and eventually I sent out a Google form survey um, to my county. So I'm from the DMV, which for those who don't know is the DC, Maryland, Virginia area. Um, I'm on the Maryland side and my county is Montgomery County. And so I sent out a survey into Montgomery County and got feedback from every school in Montgomery County. I think it was a, a fair bit over 400 responses uh, from students all over just asking them, you know, about their mental health. Uh, about how they were doing and about mainly the resources that they're provided from the counseling department. You know, that led to some more research in the counseling department, uh, you know, starting to ask questions from the counselors themselves, from the administrators to try to get both sides of that. And that eventually led to some meetings with, uh, you know, the head of counseling, the head of psychology within Montgomery County. And we kind of discussed a little bit about what, you know, I saw was happening from this research and, you know, the direction that I thought we should be going. Uh, with the counseling department, being that the counseling department is the main resource that students have for mental health. Um, and I felt pretty good leaving that meeting. I was pretty excited, got all the work in. Um, and then, you know, nothing really happened as a result. And I reached out and, you know, didn't hear much back. And so I'm a little bit frustrated that I kind of felt like I was heard, but, you know, not really seen in that sense. Um, and so I started to think about, you know, my power uh, as a student and what I could do to, you know, affect a real change. And what I realized was, you know, from those meetings, I was just one individual. You know, I worked alongside other students to conduct that research, but in those meetings, I was just one individual trying to represent a whole student body uh, across, you know, Montgomery County, I think has over a million residents total. Um, and so I started to think how I could get more power as a student and try to unite uh, different students to create an actual change. And that's what led me into the coalition that Kelly was talking about earlier, uh, wherein I tried to bring together a lot of these different mental health oriented clubs because most schools in Montgomery County and in the DMV area, they do have mental health clubs. You know, Active Minds is really prominent, You Matter is really prominent, but they don't tend to do a whole lot of work uh, outside just the school based and community level. So the idea behind that coalition was just to kind of radicalize or galvanize probably um, a whole lot more or a lot of the support that already exists just to a higher level at the, the local and the state levels of legislation. Um, and that led to a lot of work uh, specifically within, you know, Maryland's legislative window in 2021, trying to have a lot of support towards uh, student mental health is um, and another bill that was passing through. And then at the same time, in addition to that, I was starting to realize, you know, how long uh, legislative process really takes. Because, you know, again, we don't really have a lot of education on that. I was kind of learning on my feet. Um, and I was starting to realize how long it would take, and I really wanted to enact more of an immediate change. So I started looking around for ways to do this, and I came upon mental health, or sorry, I came upon peer support. Uh, you know, peer support programs are pretty much everywhere in the college level, but nowhere to be seen too much at high school. So I worked with my school to try to uh, model a peer support group for the high school level. And that kind of sums up most of my work to, to date, in addition to a little bit of work with uh, MHA in their, in their uh, school-based policy report. Great. Thanks so much. Can't wait to hear more. Cameron, how about you? Could you share a little about your work and, and how you personally got started in it? Sure. Um, first, thank you so much for having me here. It's always a pleasure um, to join into any speaking opportunity with Ben. He's amazing, if you can't tell. 
Um, so I originally, I think, got involved in mental health advocacy at a pretty young age, pretty similar to Ben. I lost a few family members at a young age to suicide. And um, it, when I was in high school, I don't remember mental health ever being discussed, ever. We didn't have counselors on, on our campus or in our high school. Um, and my senior year of high school, I lost one of my best friends to suicide. Um, and it was, it was really difficult. I went to a really small charter school. Um, our senior class was um, 50 at most. And um, it felt really odd that we didn't have supports after that. And we had to just attend school, um, go on with our day, and um, try to navigate the system on our own um, without the help of an institution, unfortunately. And I thought, um, I wanted to help other students and um, I, I really wanted to do what I could to ensure that we had a sense of community and let other um, folks know in the high school that they are not alone. And so I first um, got started, I think, really heavily my senior year when I helped co-create a local scholarship um, called the Leticia Huera Salina Scholarship. And what we did was we just asked students in the high school, what are you doing to promote um, a healthy well-being, um, mental health, what are you doing to combat suicide awareness, and um, from there we started giving out scholarships, um, mostly at that specific high school, and then we grew it out to the larger community in Pueblo, Colorado, and so we've been running that scholarship program um, for about six years now, which is amazing, and um, through that I was able to learn a lot more about the importance of sharing your story and hearing directly from students in high school and then specifically students who are interested in um, pursuing higher education after they graduated. Um, from there a few years later I heard about an organization called Young Invincibles when I was in my undergraduate studies and um, at the time they had a position open to be a young adult leader in a leadership program and I participated in that program. I then was a regional and national uh, advisory board member and then I eventually applied for a full-time position here in Colorado and um, started running the program myself and have been with the organization since October of 2018. So I'm coming up on three years, which is crazy to think about. Um, and so what we do at Young Invincibles is we work with young people to elevate their voices in the political process and then we also share more information about what that process is really like and pay them to directly be involved in our policy initiatives. Um, as Ben mentioned, there's not a lot of information specifically for young people on how accessible actually things are, specifically on how to contact an elected official, um, the need to hear young adult voice. Um, and what I mean by accessible is there, there's opportunities to be there, but unfortunately those opportunities are during the time that high school students, college students are attending school, they're working part-time, full-time jobs. And so we kind of teach them how to navigate that system a little bit more better, that works better for them, and um, ensuring that there are ways to be, to be involved and also there are ways to hopefully advocate for more flexibility within the system itself. Um, so at Young Invincibles, we focus on a few different policy buckets, including healthcare, higher education, and workforce development. Um, so behavior health has fell really neatly um, in between the healthcare and higher education branches. And since our office opened in Colorado in 2016, uh, we were working specifically with a lot of college students across the state on some individual institutional level policy changes in regards how to better their behavior health programs um, on college campuses. And from there, we started partnering with the Department of Higher Education to create what's called the Healthy Minds Checklist, which is um, what I'll probably be sharing um, the majority about today. And then we've also worked on a variety of different initiatives, like just hosting behavior health events um, across different communities in the state of Colorado. We worked on different state policies. Um, like last year, we worked on a bill that would require insurance companies to cover um, coverage for a mental health checkup, just like a, a physical checkup. Um, and then we've also been partnering with a variety of different organizations like Active Minds and the Wellbeing Trust to create a mental health advocacy toolkit that would teach young adults across the nation on how to get involved in mental health advocacy um, on a time that works for them and on a level that makes sense for them as well without pushing them in one direction or the other. Um, and so overall, I, I've just been, I think, very involved here in Colorado, specifically in mental health initiatives in any way I can, and have been trying to provide young people um, similar 
to to me and my experiences um, tools that could really help them get involved on a level that they're comfortable with, whether that's a local, state, or federal level. Awesome. And I think like you both are saying, there's a similar theme in the way that your work complements each other. Like Ben was saying that he's, um, when he was inspired to do this work and, and try to figure out, like captured the power that students really do have in speaking for themselves and advocating for themselves. And then Cameron on your side, really um, showing students that they do have that power. Um, so the, the work that you both do is really complementary in that way. Something you both said, um, which brings us to kind of a question about what you think um, currently with, with all this work that you've been doing, um, what are some of the major issues in school-based uh, mental health and uh, policies that we need to push forward because of this? One thing that you both mentioned were that people don't really know the words, you know, depression, anxiety, they don't really have meaning, they're very clinical. So how can, you know, adults listening and, um, you know, other, and students who want to advocate for themselves really tackle what these major issues are? Um, in schools. Yeah, um, I'm sure Cameron can speak. There's a whole nother level deeper than I can just because it really is surrounding uh, what her work is. But, you know, from the student level and from my perspective, um, you know, we weren't really provided or not, we just weren't provided any mental health education whatsoever at middle school, which I think is especially important because that's such a, de a developmental time for students. But even in high school, you know, we weren't provided anything more than probably a one semester video that came from the 90s and is entirely out of date, entirely unapplicable to the nuanced lives that students have, especially with the role that technology plays with student mental health and social media. Like, I have not heard anything from uh, school education covering those complexities. I think it's so important today. Uh, you know, if you look at, there's a spreadsheet I was looking at a little while back where it showed all the different states who either do or don't have mental health education requirements for their schools and a lot of them do like Maryland does for instance but I think it's really important to look at what constitutes as mental health education and what kind of education we're really getting students because sure I did get the mental health education from Maryland I got like technically speaking they hit the requirement of course I learned from the 90s perspective what depression means but it does not talk about you know all the different factors that go into it all the, uh, the important peer support techniques that every student should know just to be a good resource for the friends around them and you know the great uh, techniques to support your own mental health and watch out for yourself and see red flags and yourself. I think these are really important things to students at the practical level that we're just not really covering. But I'm sure you know I'm sure Cameron can say a lot more about you know the policy side of things as well. I, th I think Ben's absolutely correct. What we're hearing from a lot of young people in, in Colorado is that they really did wish that there was some kind of um, curriculum that was enforced in their schools, both on a honestly a middle school, high school, and a collegiate level, which is really difficult to do to tell institutions that they need to um, start incorporating different curriculum and telling them what they need to teach their students. But when it's coming from the students directly, hopefully it's a little bit um, more persuasive. And um, another thing that we're hearing that even if they can't involve it as a course in high school or college, maybe they could just start getting better at using the language surrounding mental health, um, because that really does help reduce the amount of stigma. Um, and when you reduce the amount of stigma that students are facing both pers personally and with their peers, it's really going to help um, encourage them to help start having conversations and hopefully feel a little bit more comfortable asking for help or telling themselves it's okay to ask for help. Um, because when they go on to, to college and um, they know that they, they might need help or um, that they're interested in getting help, I think what's difficult is they don't know how to navigate that system. And if they could start off at a younger age telling them these are the different things that might be available to you, you, you might need counseling, you might want to maybe just go and, and sit a puppy and see if your institution could let you pet a puppy for a little bit before finals, um, maybe you do need medication, or maybe you, you need to go to a peer support program and just talk about um, what's going on in your life. Um, things like that make it a little bit easier for them to navigate adulthood when they're juggling classes um, on a collegiate level, part-time, full-time jobs, um, their caregivers. It, it's really difficult to 
just in general transition into adulthood, much much less adding on all these additional pressures and not really um, sharing how complex the system is. And that's just on a collegiate level. Um, that doesn't say when if they if their college doesn't offer a few free counseling services. Um, if they don't, then they have to try to find, find an, a way to navigate the system outside of their college campus, which is even more difficult, unfortunately, especially if they don't have health care insurance. Yeah, you know, yeah. I can really easily attest to that being as though I'm making that transition right now. It's definitely a huge change from being you know, in a really structured place where you have know, this class, this class, this class, to, you know, fully taking care of myself and having to manage my time entirely for myself. Those schools, I mean, those skills are pretty useful, and I've been exposed to them just because of my involvement in that school, so I think I'm pretty lucky for that. But I know a whole lot of students that are really struggling to, you know, make time for themselves and support themselves, and maybe that's reading a book or making time to go for a run, and that's really positive for them, but they just can't really do that and can't manage it really well. Um, but that's an interesting thing you said earlier, Kim, about uh, being able to kind of integrate the education a little bit more, whereas that might be having an actual curriculum for mental health. I think that it might be pretty hard, especially coming from like a school district or a school like mine that's really competitive. A lot of students really only focus on, you know, AP classes, something that they can put on a college application. So, you know, a lot of students might see taking a class on mental health, I'll be extremely useful and supportive to their well-being, just not, which is a waste of time for them. So I've heard a lot of ideas about, you know, schools integrating mental health education into the actual classes. And I think that's a really great idea where, you know, a lot of these schools have pretty set curriculums, maybe that'd be like English or science that you're going to take and just kind of inserting mental health education. I think that'd be really easy in a lot of English classes specifically where, you know, students are required to take those classes anyways, just taking maybe a couple of days out of the year specifically focused on mental health or even just covering subject matter on mental health through the curriculum itself. Like maybe instead of reading The Great Gatsby, read a book about mental health like uh, When Breath Turns to Air by Paul Clancy. Great book, just threw that in there. Um, but you know, I think it's really important to try and just get the mental health education in there somehow. And I think kind of inserting it into the education would be a great way to do that. Those are great suggestions. And I think something that I'm seeing in the chat too is um, people speaking about their own mental health. Like there, there could also be the way that you guys are both saying, like ways to incorporate how you speak about your own coping mechanisms, or if you have an IEP, or if you have a um, learning disability in different ways, how we can be more vocal about that. Because we can speak from the top down a lot um, with different literacy, but how can you actually speak and, and, and own something so it doesn't feel like it carries that stigma? Um, so maybe even incorporating that into some of what you're saying, um, as I'm seeing people writing in the chat right now. Great, um, I think maybe a, a pivot from this would just be, you know, this, these are what the students are saying um, and what you're, you know, helping them advocate for and ways to navigate this. How is this received uh, from, you know, your organization with the Young Invincibles when you speak to legislatures or even higher policy um, levels at schools? And as a student, Ben, when you're reaching out um, and speaking to legislators, how is, it, how is it received? Do they agree with you? Do they push back? Could you share a little about that? I'm, I'm happy to jump in first. Um, here in Colorado anyway, our General Assembly is amazing and I think they love any opportunity where they're able to hear from a young adult or young person. Um, it's actually something that they contact Young Invincibles for all the time when they have some like an initiative or a bill that they're really passionate about. They know that if they could get some young adults behind it and, and leading these different um, organizing efforts or initiatives, um, it's really powerful um, because young adults are, are really great organizers and, and once they're just given the tools they need um, and a little bit more information about what they can do, it, it's amazing and it's powerful. Um, most of the time what we do is we teach young adults about the importance and the balance of yes research and data is really important and there's wonderful organizations that are able to provide that with or provide us with that but what's really impactful is for them sharing their story when they're of course they're ready and when they're comfortable um, but we teach them that it's really difficult for decision makers, especially elected officials, to question your experience um, because that's what you went through and that's what you need. And there's no there's no question about it. Um, and so when we teach young people about the importance of storytelling, it's been um, very impactful. When we were working on the bill last year um, to require insurance companies to cover mental health checkups, um, 
we got bipartisan support across the board, which was amazing, and it passed through the General Assembly. And the year prior, Governor Polis vetoed this bill. And this year, we had our young people record videos and send him um, reasons why they needed this. And this year, he signed it into, into law. And we heard directly from elected officials that because of the young people, um, that they, they decided to move it forward because they really heard um, that it was needed. And so I think um, that that just speaks for itself, honestly. Yeah, and um, on my side of things with the, uh, the state legislature, um, I, I can't say too much about specifically, you know, mental health education because most of my involvement at the state legislature was surrounding mental health days, um, but I can talk a little bit about the response that I got from legislators. So in Maryland, a student can take a mental health day currently, but it is required that they have a signed position, kind of like say this is excused for an actual medical reason. And because of that, a lot of the legislators seem really hesitant to, you know, add this in addition to that because they kind of point to it and they're like, hey, this already exists. We don't need you know, mental health days in the way that you're pitching it. Um, and I think that really misses a very large point of the reason why we have mental health days is so students can support themselves, be that if they have depression, if they have anxiety, if they have a diagnosed mental illness, but also if you know you don't have that and you're just going through a rough time and you need a little bit of extra time to support yourself and kind of gather your thoughts and work through whatever you might be going through because there's so many students caught in that little gray area between you know perfect mental health and wellness and you know diagnosed mental illness where they're still struggling a little bit and they're just not really given many avenues to support themselves. And so it was really frustrating to see on the state level when a lot of listeners just kind of pointed out be like, hey, this already exists and I'm really trying to articulate the point that they're missing out on a whole demographic of people who are really struggling and deserve the support that mental health days would give them, but it, it didn't end up passing in the Maryland state legislature. So. <laughs> That's an interesting point too, because, and you, you both kind of touched on this earlier, that what you're hearing from students and, and what you were advocating for is really focused, like when we think in the clinical space about prevention because everything that you're talking about when it comes to um, you know, uh, making sure that people have access to counseling center or making sure that insurance is covering things, like that's at a point where someone like really needs help. But we're talking even before that prevention, literacy of your, of your own, like we said, different things that, are that you're dealing with, maybe just a, a time to take a break. And if, and if we don't, and if legislatures and, and people who are in positions to policy don't make time for that, then we will continue this pipeline of people needing more severe help because they didn't um, intervene at that level. So that's something that I know, um, like I said, my supervisor, Victor Vitell, he, he looks a lot and, and trying to really advocate for that, for prevention at this level and making sure that you have time to just like take a break sometimes. Um, Absolutely. Great, thank you. I think that's a really great part, um, especially when you look at the high school, middle school level, when it's so developmental, and it's really important to practice prevention and to set students up for success and well-being you know, throughout their lives. And that's one of the main arguments that I kind of propose with mental health days that I feel like a lot of people kind of brushed over. And it's that a lot of schools tend to have resources, or, and even if they don't have the resources, they can have uh, referrals to uh, resources in the community. Where if a student's struggling, you know, they can point them in that direction. And mental health days is a great opportunity to allow st schools to identify the students in the population that are struggling, but not necessarily a crisis just yet, and to get them the resource to help them support themselves before they reach crisis. I think that's so important. I don't think enough people are talking about that, where, you know, a lot of students can kind of fly under the school's radar and not really hit that crisis point, but they're really getting there. And it's so important to catch them before they get to that point especially if you're buried by stigma. You know, you may be even hiding it and, and kind of like you said, being under, under the radar, definitely. Um, okay, I want to talk a little bit, if Cameron, if you can speak about the Healthy Campus Initiative that you mentioned. Sure, absolutely. Um, and as I mentioned, we have a young adult leadership development program that we run every year. And because of our age group, I think naturally we attract a lot of college students because we work with young people between 18 to 34. Um, and so when we first started running this program a few years ago, we were um, 
granted some funds for our young people to work on any healthcare initiative that was important to them. And we kept hearing over and over again, I want to work on behavioral health. I want to work on some policy changes on my campus and specifically on programs that are going to benefit um, vulnerable populations and communities on campus. Um, because we are seeing that a lot of these programs aren't being tailored to students of color, Pell eligible um, student parents, and so what we decided to do was provide tools to these students to help run um, institutional level advocacy and policy changes, um, ranging from providing uh, the Colorado Suicide Hotline on the back of every student ID, um, trying to advocate for cultural competent counseling services on campuses, um, bringing in part-time counselors in the evening, um, specifically at community colleges, because we heard that a lot of the students at community colleges are working full-time jobs during the day and they have to go in at night and they would love to utilize the counseling services but they're not open um, and then just helping larger institutions draft language um, about where their behavioral health services are located on campus and adding it to the bottom of their class syllabi um, so as we started working with different institutions across the state we learned that the institutions were very receptive they really wanted to hear what the recommendations of the students were and they started implementing these different policies um, at the time, we were an office of full full, two full-time staff located in Denver, downtown Denver, and we started thinking to ourselves, how can we start reaching more institutions and students? And that's when we started um, partnering with the Colorado Department of Higher Education, what's called the Healthy Minds Checklist, and I could share that in the chat, or maybe Juliana could share that in the chat. But what it is, is uh, a checklist that has a robust list of recommendations that students and institutions um, think that they should be implementing on their campus in order to be designated as a Healthy Minds campus. The checklist is pretty straightforward. Um, the requirements include four co core programs that are non-negotiable and we think every institution in Colorado should be implementing. And that's including the um, the hotline and information about where their campus resources are at on student IDs and class syllabi, offering prevention programs that focus on um, mental health, of course, holding one awareness event a year, and then providing access to online resources and services for students. This one was a little bit tricky for us at first because at the time COVID didn't hit, and it was a little bit of an argument that we needed um, to provide services to students who were on campus. Um, but once COVID hit, this um, really, really showed us how important it was to um, ensuring that students online, obviously, which are pretty much almost every student in the state, um, they needed um, programming available to them. And then um, in addition to that, the institution has to implement six additional programming um, that focus on awareness, access, and prevention. So once they um, implement 10 programs on their campus, they put in a submission to the Colorado Department of Education, a committee reviews it, every, ensures that everything's up to date, everything looks good, and they are designated as a Healthy Minds campus. Now this, again, checklist was created by students for students and institutions, which is really amazing. And we really partnered with institutions to hear what they're what they're already implementing on campus because what we found was they had really amazing programs students just didn't know about it and so that's why awareness is a really big bucket within the checklist because they just needed a little bit more help on sharing this information to students and we're hoping this checklist could help fulfill that a little bit um, for specifically prospective students um, imagine if you're a high schooler and, and you know that you need mental health services um, over the next four years when you're in college and you see that hey CU Denver is designated as a healthy mindset campus what does that mean oh wow well, they are implementing at least 10 core programs that the state recognizes as really strong programs for me maybe i'm going to choose that over this other institution that I was on the fence about because that's really important to me um, and so this checklist was really exciting. We were able to work uh, over the past few years with the Colorado Department of Education on this checklist, in addition to other checklists that we believe are social determinants to student success. And I'm glad that we're able to ensure that behavioral health was included in there alongside food insecurity. And then we'll start working on transportation and housing, which are other issues that we know affect the mental health of students um, across the state. So, um, I could share that in the, the checklist in the, the chat if it hasn't already be sh been shared, but please let me know if you have any specific questions about it. Great, and I think Kelly did share in the chat, so people scroll up, you should see that. Uh, 
thank you, Cameron. So I'm pretty sure with this uh, Healthy Campus Initiative, there may be a 90s video on depression, like Ben was saying, wouldn't really fall into that. So I'm grateful <laughs> that there's that, that we have this that's checking and making sure that these institutions are there. And I really like that because it's something I think as the younger generation is focused on mental health, they're focused on behavioral and emotional health, it will be something that they look at when they're looking at colleges. Um, and it goes back to kind of what Ben was saying too, like students are concerned about having those AP classes, having the best of the best when it comes to education and getting in places. So like something like this will make that school the best of the best because it's going to, you know, fall into that checklist. So that's awesome and congrats on all your success, success with that. Um, ben, I wanted to direct a question to you about this. So, you know, you, you hear these things that are happening um, that a lot of students I know were involved in what Cameron was saying and really pulling it together um, to make sure that there's access and awareness um, for these things on college campuses. But as a student, um, you know, if you feel like there isn't kind of what you did, if you feel like there isn't something there and people aren't really speaking for you, how do you recommend um, students really get engaged and, and speak up for themselves? Yeah, definitely. You know, that kind of harkens back a little bit to what I was saying earlier, and I know Cam mentioned that as well, is, you know, especially in high school, a lot of students aren't given an education in advocacy or, you know, in the systems of government, especially at the state level. Like, for instance, the only government class I took in high school was AP government, and that's an AP class, so it's a very, very uh, manicured curriculum, and it hasn't really been updated for, you know, probably a very long time. And I think we only spent a single day talking about, you know, state governments and like the state legislature. So because of that, and you know, that's the state government is really where all the nitty gritty, all the good stuff is done. And all the work that I've done at the state and local level, not at the federal level where most of my education and school at least has been covering. Because of that, a lot of students really don't know where to go. You know, they see a problem and they just kind of sit with it because they don't know their power. They haven't been told their power as a student, as an individual to advocate for a change. So, you know, when, when you ask that question, I think students don't really know what to do. They don't know where to go. And that's a really frustrating thing. Um, you know, I was kind of talking about that a little bit earlier with my overview. I felt like throughout this whole kind of like mental health journey that I've been through, it's mostly just been me kind of like stumbling forward and feeling my way out because I, I don't really know what I was doing most of the time. Because I'm really just working off Google searches and all of what I've read and all my reading and all of that because we're not given too much. So I guess to answer your question, just kind of do what I did and feel your way out, but that's not how it should be. Students should be educated in what to do. They should be told how to do it. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of great organizations like Active Minds, like You Matter, these really great mental health organizations kind of speaking in a mental health way. I know your, your question was a bit more broad than that. But there's a lot of really great or organizations out there that students can get involved with to make a change. But the problem with them, even though they make a wonderful change, and I'm not, I'm not trying to detriment them whatsoever, is they usually have very set agendas and it's very difficult for a student at an individual level to you know, focus on a problem that's really impactful to them. And in my case, you know, I didn't really want to get involved with them just because I'm a pretty independent person and I really want to focus on what I want to focus on. So for students like me, there's really nowhere you can go unless you just kind of cut it out on your own and hope you kind of get to where I did where you're hopefully able to make a decent impact. So I guess to answer your question, go for the organizations. They're a, a great way for students to get involved. But on the other side of things, I think it's really important that we, you know, we start trying to educate students a lot more. I think that's honestly my number one takeaway from all the work that I've done. It's just really, we have to focus a lot more on education or educating our students. Yeah, of course. Thank you. I think um, we have some more questions that we could cover, but I know that the chat is blowing up and so is the Q&A. So maybe, uh, Kelly, if there, if you want to say anything that maybe stood out to you or um, Cameron and Ben, if you want to take a look as well, um, I just open the Q&A. Kelly, I'm going to call on you. Anything stood out to you that you think we should cover? Yeah, I mean, I think I would love to hear more something that you know i i see a lot and i think many people who work on the policy side of things or or local level programs is people say oh well we already do that or like we already have that um so do you all have any advice 
I think on the like quote like adult leadership side of like what how should adults approach young people to try to improve the quality side not just because I think there's one there's advocacy and we're doing something but um, have you all had experience in the like actual quality of the implementation of these policies or programs? Not just fulfilling like a, a checkbox, really. Like, how do you evaluate that things are growing and, and the quality of a program? That's right. Good, yeah. Good, good point. The, yeah. Because the Ben's point, right, is the man, many states will say, "Oh, we do this," and then Ben found out uh, because he was doing leadership, right, accidentally that his school was uh, his, his state was a model state. <laughs> you know, so yeah. it, it's uh, it's always so different when you're on the ground experiencing it. So, would love to hear um, more about that from either of you. Yeah, I can jump in real quick. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. I think implementation is really important and that might be something that a lot of organizations or decision makers miss when involving young people. I think that's why it's so important that um, one, we don't tokenize young people. And so if you want them to be involved in the process from start to finish and seeing it through, pay them. Um, or find a way for them to get college credit or find a way for them to somehow be able to move forward um, within their personal and professional pathways. Um, with the Healthy Minds Checklist, for example, we do plan on coming together, I think, after two years to see what institutions are starting to implement in regards to programming on their campus and bringing back um, some of the students that helped pull this together, the students that helped utilize or that actually utilize the programmings on their campus, and then future students to see how can we improve this checklist and see what has changed since 2020 when we implemented it in, in, in March and um, how can we add in additional programs or what innovative programs were institutions starting to implement that we we could actually implement all across the state just by communicating with one another. Um, and so it's, it's really important to one teach young people about the importance of implementation and seeing through and letting them know that usually when you pass any kind of policy or, or bill on a local state and federal level, it's just the skeleton of it. There's so many different ways for them to get involved and advocate even further on how to improve the programming and add in additional recommendations. Yeah, that's a really great point. I remember, I think I had a conversation with you a little while back about this. Um, it's so important that we don't tokenize our youth. You know, I think recently there's definitely been a rise in youth involvement within, you know, these organizations and government. And that's, that's amazing to see. But I just, it, it's kind of, it harkens my example a little bit earlier when I was talking about where I went to, you know, the head of the council department and head of psychology, where they did hear me, they did see me, so they can say, you know, we, we heard these students out, but really no change whatsoever resulted from that. And it, it's really frustrating from the student level to see because when students do put a lot of work in and get nothing back, it just, completely de-incentivizes it and especially even more to what you're saying where you should incentivize it i did what i did completely voluntarily you know i didn't have payment i didn't get any you know high school college credit from it and i spent a lot of time doing it um and so you know having that it was it was so it just kind of took the air out of my tires for a little bit i was so frustrated and i know i'm not the only one you know so many students who really want to make a meaningful impact kind of go through that and they just get nothing back and they get nothing back for so long to the point in which it's just like students start thinking, you know, is this even worth doing that? Um, so I think that's a really, really great point. Yeah, thank you both. And thank you, Kelly. I wonder now, uh, let's see. I'm trying to see if there's any questions that have come up. I saw one that we, we were talking a little about prevent uh, about prevention, um, but I did see one that talked um, more about some misunderstood conditions, um, maybe a little bit more severe and diagnosis in regards to uh, bipolar borderline personality. That's also sometimes conflated with depression and anxiety. And I thought that was interesting. Um, I saw that question in the Q and A twice. Is that something that you guys can speak on of anything that we, we talked a lot about depression, but in like more awareness of, of either of those? Uh, I'm confused about what the question specific is asking. I guess for mental health, like instead of 
uh, we were talking a lot about prevention and then there's another question about like panel experience with like teen mental health first aid like do you see a lot of these like really education about different diagnoses before it gets to a clinical level so um i'm trying well, to understand the question yeah no that's that's interesting um I, you know, I kind of talked a little bit, I, I hope this is the direction that the question is asking, but, you know, I talked a little bit about the lack of education that students get, and, you know, we do certainly, by the time you graduate high school, you're probably going to know what depression is, you're probably going to know what anxiety is, but, you know, they really don't cover, like, the more nuanced side of things when it comes to those conditions that, you know, a, a remarkable amount of students go through, and that they just don't have a lot of recognition in that, and I don't think a lot of the resources in schools are really directed towards that, you know, maybe you have, like, an anxiety dog that comes to school once a week that kind of helps really stress or you know has depression resources but people don't really talk about bps or sorry about borderline personality disorder or about these other i don't want to say more nuanced because that kind of takes away from those disorders but they really just don't talk about them too much and i think it is really yeah. important from the kind of student side to you know validate what they're going through that it's not just them alone because i think in recent years, we've really started to validate a lot more and kind of destigmatize you know, depression, anxiety a whole lot. But when it comes to those, I don't know how much uh, headway has been making in that direction. Right. Well, let's see. Oh, there's another question. Kelly, you want to read that one that you saw? Yeah. So I think um, Rebecca Heltebrand asked an interesting question um, about school. So she said, we keep hearing that teachers can't refer students to services unless the district they are in has a clear and defined pathway for said referrals. We understand that schools end up becoming financially and legally liable if their students need student needs or supports, um, which then hampers the process of simply helping students. Do your panelists have any insight on this policy type issue? So basically, um, it's really everybody, most people want to talk about mental health and do something, but what if there's there's not enough resources and it puts, um, like, what are your recommendations in terms of policy or just practices? This is really difficult. And as someone who works with, you know, youth and young adults, I know how difficult it could be when you have a young person or someone who's going through a crisis and you don't know when to step in. Um, you don't know the next steps, if you need to call their parents or even the authorities or what's appropriate. And um, I think that's why it's so important for anyone that works with youth to demand some kind of direction from their supervisors um, and let them know that you're experiencing this and you need more, um, more guidance on what to do next and to share examples of what has happened, what you envision happening and what you need. Um, another thing, and I saw mental health first aid come up um, and, and I appreciate that question. I, I went through that training as soon as I knew I was gonna work with young people. Um, and then we put our young people through that training in our program because they started collecting stories from one another and collecting stories from their peers and asking them to get involved. And then we heard, hey, this is really triggering. Do you have any other resources? Then we put them through trauma-informed training. Um, and then we went through mental health 101 training. And so it, it is a process and it takes time, but I do encourage um, faculty and staff to reach out to any decision makers on, on their team and ask them to start putting together some kind of practices and um, maybe researching what other schools in your district or um, what neighboring districts are, are working on because um, at the end of it, the people that suffer are the youth, unfortunately, or you go home feeling a lot of guilt because you didn't know what to do. And I think um, it, it just makes sense to um, to, to maybe take the extra time to implement something like this. Yeah. Let's see. Um, there's some people talking about uh, asking about peer support groups. How are you able to convince the school board to allow you to run a peer support group? Do, do the students have to sign waivers? That seems specific to you, Ben. Uh, there's definitely a fair bit of red tape. Um, yeah. I'm pretty sure we weren't actually able to call it a peer support group for that reason, to kind of fit into like the loophole, uh, just so that students could attend it without the school being entirely uh, liable. I know we kind of, so the, the initial idea was to just to have it be based on a one-to-one -one student uh, peer support model, where you know a, a student get trained and they get paired with a student who expresses interest with that. You know, do the the kind of social dynamics of high school, we found that to be really awkward and you know, it might be too much of a burden on the trained student. 
we kind of pivoted into a peer support uh, like group model, which was a lot better where, you know, a trained student who goes through a bit of an education uh, facilitates a group discussion where students can kind of bounce ideas off each other and just kind of work through whatever they need to. Um, it was entirely led by the students to take liability off of the school. So that's kind of how we got around that a little bit. I'm pretty sure we couldn't use the word peer support group, but that's kind of the goal of what it was. Um, I think that kind of covers what you were talking about. Yeah, that's the issue that I feel like you both have, have pointed on a lot of different red tape and what they're allowed and, and how we can move things forward. Um, as we have a few minutes left, I wonder if there's anything that you guys would like to, to touch on um, of your experiences or feel like that we haven't talked about. and. Uh, just really, how can we continue to encourage young people to be included in implementation of policies and this work and really advocate for themselves, which I know you both have touched on a lot. So if there's something else, a different direction you want to go in, uh, feel free to, sh uh, to share. Yeah, my recommendation, and, and I saw a question in the chat about a college student that wants to share mental health information on their college campus. Um, my recommendation is to be have a clear idea about what your initiative is. If you want to reduce stigma, start looking into different um, examples that have um, been done on your campus already or other campuses. If you want to just do a mental health 101, if you want to share resources, really be clear about what you're hoping to gain um, from your advocacy or your initiative. And then start doing research about what other organizations, institutions, students, young people have done. And, and don't hesitate to reach out to them first um, because the other young people are a great resource and they're able to, to talk clearly um, about their experience and what they wish they would have done differently or what they wish someone would have told them. And then also don't hesitate to reach out to organizations. Um, I know not a lot of organizations um, are usually equipped or, or usually work with young adults, but um, they are doing their best and it is an opportunity for them to hopefully start listening to young adults and start um, adding them to their staff and um, adding more young adult perspective to their initiatives and policies because that's what we're really trying to do is um, start adding young adults into decision making opportunities and um, decision making positions so um, just do your research about what's what's been done about and then also learn a little bit also more about how decisions are made and and it, in retrospect or in um and in, in how it relates to what decision or um change you want to make because that's a really good starting point and once you have a clear vision about what you want to do um that's when you could start doing the, the little bit of more advocacy and policy or even lobbying that is great advice i don't have a whole lot more to add on to that that is that is perfect right there um and so cameron i don't mean to put you on the spot but i saw in the chat something that pertains to me as well as I've just got to college and I'm looking to kind of see what to do with myself here. Somebody asked in the chat um, that they're a college student and hope to educate students on their campus about mental health. And I wanted to see, since you're kind of in this space a little bit, you know, if you have any advice on that. Can you repeat just a little bit? You broke up a little bit. Oh yeah, sorry about that. So um, as a college student, how do you think that I would be able to, you know, work with my student body and help to educate them a little bit more about mental health and just kind of advocate for mental health at that college level? Yeah, there's so many different ways um, to educate your peers. Um, one, if you don't feel like you're a trusted resource to teach mental health, maybe bring in your um, mental health center on campus, partnering with the mental health center in the community and being clear about what you would like them to teach the students. Maybe hosting an event, doing a tabling event, giving out flyers. Um, also, maybe just doing research about what other student groups are, are working on, partnering with them on an, on an initiative. Um, try not to reinvent the wheel because Ben, you mentioned it's, it's tiring and it could be exhausting. And I think what's happening is young people, um, they're, they're starting to take a step back because they don't feel supported. They, they feel unsure about what next steps are. They, they don't know what to do next. And so um, ask for help, ask for people to get involved, make it, make it a community effort um, because th that's what's really important. You, you're not in this alone and there's other people who want to help. And so um, start just talking with others and, and start brainstorming about what you want to do. Thank you. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you both. And thank you, Kelly, for organizing this.
me and this has been fantastic. Um, I'm very lo much looking forward to seeing the work that you and your organizations will continue to do um, and following you guys along the way. So Kelly, any last words? Awesome. Yeah, no, just thank you all so much. Thanks, Juliana. Thanks both to our panelists and everybody who attended. Um, you will get a follow-up email with the recording and opportunity to get a certificate of attendance. Um, and otherwise, thanks to all again and have a great rest of your day.